So I will give you I will give you an overview of this area of very active research. Um, I will probably spend most of the time on the first two parts because I think, uh, given the topic of uh, the theme today, um, that, that those are the most interesting aspects. Um, so, Mendelian randomization is really an instrument to variable method. We look at this, and it stands and falls with the assumptions how much you believe in the assumptions, and it's therefore always a question can we test the assumptions? Or can we at least do something that makes us believe them or, or make them at least halfway plausible? So we will look at that. Um, so I will take you through the basic ideas by first looking at a very um, uh, prominent example. It's probably one of the uh, most successful applications of Mendelian randomization, I would say, where we are interested in the effect of alcohol consumption on some health health outcome and we use a genotype um, to mimic the effect of alcohol. So obviously in epidemiology we are typically interested in the effect of interventions, in public health interventions. We want to give people advice on what to do and what to avoid, drink that alcohol, eat folic acid, uh, etc. So you, it's very much at the core of um, the research um, that you want causal relations. You don't want to give people advice to do something if it's only based on an association won't actually help in the end. So uh, we do want, we do have causal questions in epidemiology because of um, the public health uh, aspect. But we also in epidemiology usually only have observational studies. A lot of the quantities of interest cannot really be randomized or um, you'd only randomize them once you have a good reason to believe that there is an effect. So. Uh, there are various reasons why we first of all look at observational studies. Uh, also, we want to know the effect in, in the general population and not just in a very specific population chosen for the randomized controlled trials. So the obvious problem will be confounding, and there are lots of methods to deal with uh, observed confounding, how to adjust for it in some clever ways, etc. But really, in the end, um, it's, it's also difficult to convince yourself that you don't have unobserved confounding left, and you'd like a method that can also deal with this. So let's go to this example with the uh, alcohol consumption. So I'm going to use little DAGs, which have directed acyclic graphs like this, which have a formal definition. I'm not going to uh, talk much about how DAGs are defined, um, but there is, there is a, a math behind a graph like this. So uh, we are interested in the effect of alcohol consumption on disease. And it's quite obvious that the alcohol is confounded with lots of uh, lifestyle factors, uh, other health behaviors, etc. Um, so, and, and uh, it'll be difficult to convince yourself that you've ever measured enough and correctly and without error, etc. So, uh, it's more likely that there's some unobserved um, confounding still there. So, a particular study um, that has looked at this is this one cited here. Um, and we have to ask ourselves what can we do in this case? So obviously we cannot randomize alcohol consumption. Uh, even if you could convince people for a small amount of time to stick to a protocol, uh, it's really also lifetime. You want to know the effect of lifetime alcohol consumption. Um, so if we can't randomize what we are interested in, then we have to see whether we can find something that's similar to randomization. So where nature has randomized. And that would be an instrumental variable. So basically, the instrumental variable is the next best thing um, when you can't randomize the actual quantity that you are interested in. And the instrumental variable will allow some inference. It's not quite as uh, powerful as an actual randomized trial, of course, but it will allow some inference about intervention even in the presence of unobserved confounding. Um, but you can't just decide to <coughs> use an instrumental variable because you have to find one where nature has provided one and um, uh, which, which um, satisfies the, uh, the assumptions that you need in order to do the inference that you want. So you have to be lucky that in a situation um, where you're interested in cause and effects that you can actually find an instrument variable. And it has been uh, very popular in the last 10 years or so to um, look for genetic variants for the kind of quantities that epidemiologists are interested in. So if it's a genetic variant, because genes are passed on according to Mendel's laws, 
uh, it's called Mendelian randomization because it's trying to replace uh, something where you'd like to randomize but you can't for practical reasons or whatever reasons uh, and you then use uh, the genes which in a way have been randomly assigned according to Mendel's laws and that replaces uh, your randomization. So in the um, uh, in the artwork consumption, so that it says again in blue, if we can't randomize this book, for instance, this is where nature has randomized through genetic variation. In the artwork consumption, uh, such um, uh, g uh, genetic uh, variant exists. The AIDH2 uh, gene uh, determines basically how alcohol is being um, metabolized in, in the body. And if you have the bad version of this gene, then um, you have a very strong and immediate adverse reaction to alcohol consumption. So it's not just the next day, we all have the hangover next day, but this is an immediate uh, reaction so that people who have that gene really don't, almost don't drink, very rarely, very little. Um, especially those who have uh, the homozygotes on this gene that have this very strongly. So um, if we can argue that this uh, genotype is, uh, uh, that, that this uh, genetic variant is distributed randomly in the population, then that's like telling a random subset of our population, you can't drink. And, and people really do adhere to this because of these immediate bad reactions. So it's almost as good as a random sample. Of course, it doesn't mean that everyone else drinks. They will, some of them will drink and some of them will But we have a random sample where we've kind of not disallowed drinking. Um, so if we see that these individuals have different risks, um, typically lower risks for all kinds of things, then um, uh, then um, we have some evidence that uh, alcohol is doing something, or at least that not drinking improves uh, health. So I want to define a bit formally what I'm going to talk about. And I'm going to use um, what's called the decision theoretic approach. You have different ways of formalizing uh, causality. People often um, in the medical stats literature use potential outcomes. In the artificial intelligence literature, um, use the Pearl's do operator. And if you did your PhD with Philip or work with Philip, you use the um, uh, uh, decision theoretic approach. So here we uh, say we want to make explicit that we are looking at a different type of conditional distribution. And we are going to use an indicator sigma. So sigma, you can remember, maybe stands for strategy. So a strategy where we tell people do this. So if x is some value, then it means um, we give the advice, eat five portions of fruit a day or something like this. Uh, and that's the, uh, the intervention that we're looking at. Or we let people do what they want, and then that's the empty set or the idle uh, indicator here, and that means uh, the uh, exposure that we are looking at uh, arises naturally. So basically, under the intervention, we fix the value of x, and that's like uh, you would do in a randomized controlled trial. You would give pe these people get the treatment, and those don't get the treatment and you can directly observe the intervention distribution. Whereas in an observational study, you are observing where this is idle, so where people choose what they do with the uh, exposure. Okay, so this, if we then look at the uh, distribution of the outcome under an intervention, that's basically like what we would observe in a randomized trial, and it is the total effect of exposure on uh, the response. It doesn't matter on which various direct or indirect path page, pathways it works. And the usual conditional distribution, so this here, would denote we observe y given that we have observed x. So whatever way x came about, we just observe it, it came about, um, and it's basically the, uh, the distinction between these two things that we mean when we say association is not causation. This the blue thing here describes association, and the red thing describes causation. Y depends on the value of x here, we have causation. If y depends on the value of x here, we have association. So what, they are, what uh, an instrumental variable or any causal inference method should give us is, if we observe this, how do we get to this? 
if we, if basically, if our data comes from here, how do we get to this? And the uh, instrumental variable does give us uh, a bit uh, in this direction. Again, I'm using the little dags to illustrate um, the assumptions. So what makes the gene, G now st stands for gene, genotype, an instrumental variable for the effect of X on Y. So think of X as alcohol consumption and Y as coronary heart disease. Uh, U is the unobserved confounding. Had we observed U, we could adjust for the confounding and we would <coughs> get uh, a causally valid um, uh, inference. But we haven't, or at least not all of it. So what we require is that uh, the instrument or the genotype is independent, the symbol means independence, is independent of you uh, in the idle regime. It must not be independent of the exposure that we are interested in because that's the thing that we want to kind of mimic the randomization of. So it would be uh, very unfortunate if they were independent and there's not, no information. And, and this is a bit, um, this is a tricky uh, assumption, it should be conditionally independent of the outcome given uh, the exposure and the unobserved confounder. So that we can't really test this because unobserved confounders are by definition unobserved. What it means is that there should be no direct effect of G on Y and there should also not be any confounding affecting G and Y. So we have confounding affecting X and Y but we should not have any confounding affecting G and Y. So ideally, we, if, if we can't randomize X, ideally we'd like to randomize G. Then we could ensure that all of these, uh, well, maybe not the direct effect one, that could still be a direct effect, but all the uh, absence of confounding we would ensure in that case. Um, so we really have to argue that nature randomizes the genes, which really it doesn't because you inherit your genes from your parents. Um, but as you will see, we can still argue quite well. We also make assumptions about the intervention. So in fact, uh, in order, if we want to talk about uh, intervening in X, that needs to be meaningful. And if, it's, if, if you think, well, often it's not meaningful, then I'm asking you, well, what is your causal inference about? What are you trying to infer? In, uh, the, the, the clearer you can be about this, the more you can meaningfully, meaningfully talk about the assumptions and check the assumptions and convince others to believe in the assumptions. Um, so this is these assumptions here are basically saying that an intervention in X must be meaningful in the sense that we can just go and change X itself. Um, so the assumptions are equivalent to this factorization that's without the sigma here. Um, and our inference is basically saying uh, we want to think about a situation where we just exchange the distribution of x, which um, uh, in a randomized trial we would be able to do. We would just flip a coin for x, but in uh, uh, many situations we can't. But it's what, it's what our inference wants to be about. Uh, under the intervention, if we could randomize x, what we would see is that we would break this arrow here and we would just fix x. So that's our, what our intervention is about. Uh, so sometimes this uh, independence that we then have between g and y, given we intervene in x, is also known as the exclusion restriction. So in some parts of the literature on instrumental variables, you see the um, assumptions summarized as exclusion restriction. And uh, they don't really refer to you, that, so it's a different way of phrasing the assumptions. So what can we do then with an instrument? So this is what an instrument should formally allow us to do. Uh, what can we then, what do we obtain with these assumptions? First of all, we can just check the association between the outcome and the instrument. And there should only be an association rough if and only if, I put this in quotation mark, uh, if there is a causal effect of X on Y. So it's a kind of replacement test. It's a bit like an in intention to treat analysis, um, where G would be the intention and Y is the outcome that you're measuring. And under the assumptions, you should only see an association if there is a causal effect. Um, usually we want to estimate the causal effect. So 
uh, without further assumptions, um, we cannot point identify the causal effect, but we can get bounds on the causal effect. So we can say, because with what I have observed and with the assumptions, the causal effect cannot be lower than this and larger than this. Uh, we have written a SATA package that does this. It only works for a few, when, when all the variables have, uh, are discrete and have few different levels, otherwise the computations become very complex and it's not feasible when you have continuous variables. And for point estimates, you need some semi-parametric or parametric uh, assumptions. Usually people use structural equation models, for example, for this. Uh, so <coughs> let's look at the uh, reasoning with the testing. So if I assume there is no cause and effect from x on y, so I'm deleting the arrow from x to y here, then if you're familiar with DAGs, you may rec recognize that in this DAG, g and y are marginally independent. There is a path between them, but because the path contains a collider, it's an open path, and there, uh, it's a blocked path, and therefore there is uh, no association between them. So you should see this uh, in your data. If there's no cause the effect of x on y, there should be an independence between g and y. The one reason why I'm uh, saying you need to be cautious is if you act as a weird effect modifier, so you could have an effect of x on y, which is positive for one value of u and negative for another value of u, and they just happen to cancel out, uh, and then that messes things up. But this is known as a, in, in the artificial intelligence literature as something called lack of faithfulness to the graph, uh, and it's often just assumed away. <laughs> but it's um, in, in practice, um, even because you never have an infinite sample size, you have to worry about power of your test, etc. So things that come close to this kind of counseling might be a problem. But for all practical purposes, I think that when you do a Mendelian randomization analysis, you should first of all just carefully investigate the gene and outcome association and basically forget about the exposure measurement in the first place. So we're not using X at all here. Uh, so even if we've mismeasured X, or if we think we haven't specified X very good, very well, it doesn't matter because we're just using the instrument and the outcome for this. And that should be our first step in the analysis. <coughs> so I've already discussed the assumptions a little bit, but let's see how in practice uh, they are being justified. So with some examples, and also with some examples how they are violated. Um, uh, yeah. So it's, these are the assumptions again. There should be no edge between G and U. There should be no edge between G and Y. And there should be the association between G and X, which I've highlighted in red. Uh, so the association between G and X, you can, of course, test, because you, have, you should have measured G and X. And the other two things you cannot test. And you find time and again in the literature that people think they can test them, but they've forgotten that they cannot condition on you, so um, you, uh, you can't test them. In particular, none of these conditional independencies are implied or should hold uh, by these uh, assumptions. So there's sometimes a bit of confusion in the literature. So mo mostly, the main thing is to use subject matter background knowledge and some tricks to justify these assumptions. Let's have a look. Um, so the idea is that uh, this, this first one, the, the dotted line in red with the number one has uh, been discussed here. Uh, the genes are randomly allocated from the parents to the child. Uh, so in a way, there is some randomization going on there. But what you've got to convince yourself of is that then the properties of the parents or the parents' genes are also not associated with the uh, unobserved lifestyle confounders in this case. So uh, there, there's no particular reason why they should be. You could say that the parents, if the parents <coughs> already have the gene that they can't drink alcohol, then probably the child wouldn't drink alcohol very much anyway because the parents didn't do this, but that would affect their own alcohol consumption, not the other lifestyle things. So uh, further, what people have done and do with this uh, example, but also with others, is that in many studies you have measured lots and lots of covariates and often they don't even get used. Um, and they have just uh, looked at association, tests of association between genotypes and all these um, uh, lifestyle covariates, and there's a, a nice overview paper here 
that, uh, and they haven't found any associations there. So the genes uh, in this case are not associated with all these other lifestyle factors that might be relevant. So you can, of course, test the lack of association with observed confounders. You still don't know, you can't, still can't test it with really unobserved ones, but at least you can convince yourself with the observed ones that it's not associated. So then the other um, uh, absence, of, absence of a direct effect. So they are knowing the, um, the chemistry of the gene heads and it is uh, here very well known exactly what the uh, uh, biochemistry is and what it does, how it affects the metabolism of alcohol, and that it doesn't, uh, shouldn't affect coronary heart disease uh, directly. There is no particular reason or uh, other evidence uh, to suggest that. So, but of course, this is something that only works when you have a very well studied uh, genetic variant, and with a lot of gen genetic variants nowadays coming from genome-wide association studies, we might not believe, we might, we might not be so easy to convince ourselves of this assumption anymore. <coughs> so the association between instrument and um, exposure can be studied because they are both supposed to be measured. And um, this is a plot from one of the papers, and they really should have given you the confidence intervals. But this is the uh, uh, alcohol consumption when, for those who have two times the bad version of the gene. This is for the heterozygotes, and this is for those who don't have a bad version. So you can see there is uh, an increase in alcohol consumption if you don't have these adverse reactions. Um, so now let's think in this example about just testing for a causal effect of alcohol consumption. In this case, it was sorry, it was um, coronary heart disease. Um, and uh, there's uh, these findings reported in the paper. So we compare uh, blood pressure as a continuous measurement, for example, um, and it's, uh, it's much higher for those who have the normal alcohol consumption. So this mimics large versus low alcohol consumption. And if we compare the heterozygous, then it mimics moderate versus low alcohol consumption. And even the moderate one is, um, is harmful in the analysis here. So that now we come to an interesting aspect of another way how we can convince ourselves of the assumptions. Um, this uh, uh, genotype is particularly uh, prevalent in the Asian population, and this study I think was mostly done with the Japanese population. And they found in their data set that the women didn't drink at all, regardless of their genotype. So they are like a control group. So if we want to, if we go back to this assumption, if someone doubts that there might maybe be a direct effect or some other pathway between a type and outcome, then we should, even in the women who don't drink, find an association. So this is something that they investigated. And uh, this is the meta-analysis of uh, these studies. And this is for the women, so there is no association. Uh, found, it being in the middle, whereas for the men, you find the association with a bit of variation between studies. So this is another way of how we can convince ourselves, so unless there is a very strong uh, uh, sex effect on uh, what is going on, um, which is implausible, um, uh, this is uh, evidence that there is um, no other pathway between the genotype and the outcome other than through alcohol consumption. So other examples of Mendelian randomization, it has been used uh, in many contexts, and it's not just the alcohol example. Uh, so people uh, found uh, genetic variants, for example, for fibrinogen and homocysteine, CRP, a body mass index, um, especially there's a lot of work on body mass index, and people are now using multiple instruments lots of genetic uh, variants that predict body mass index. Uh, and um, we've given an overview, but that's already a bit old, so there are many newest studies now of um, the Mendelian randomization studies. Yeah. So this was more to convince you that 
the um, assumptions are satisfied, but of course, I'm, I'm sure all of you have already got some something in your mind, but this could not work, this might not work, etc. So let's think about how they might be viable. <coughs> Um, one thing to keep in mind is population stratification, because as I said, the genes come from the parents. Um, and the parents might be from a subpopulation, especially ethnic background, etc., which often goes together with different lifestyles, especially regarding alcohol consumption, etc. So we have to worry about that, because what population stratification does, um, if um, within population the allele frequencies might be different, because People don't mix across population, they stay within the population. And there, uh, there might be other reasons why the disease is maybe more prevalent or less prevalent in the population. And then we would have this confounding here. <clears throat> now this is something that the, uh, the people uh, who use Mendelian randomization who I work with are very aware of. And you can <coughs> um, stratify by population or you can just look at one population in the first place like they did with the alcohol study that I just use the Japanese uh, uh, studies, um, or um, what people do is they uh, uh, use the principal component analysis to stratify by the population uh, substructure, etc. So that's already quite a lot being done to avoid this problem. Um, this is an early example for extreme to illustrate this. So uh, in this uh, subgroup of Native Americans, um, there was a strong inverse association between the particular haplotype and type 2 diabetes, but you also find that the prevalence is very different. So there's a haplotype prevalence 1%, type 2 diabetes of 40%, and the uh, Caucasian population instead you have a haplotype prevalence 66% and type 2 diabetes 50%. So very different for these populations. And that would be exactly this, the red structure there, different uh, genotype pre uh, prevalence, different disease prevalences. Uh, and that could have lots of other reasons to do with the subpopulations. So of course you need to be aware of the existence of such subpopulations, but people are quite aware of this and are trying to be careful about it. Linkage disequilibrium is another um, possibility of how this could be violated. And this uh, linkage disequilibrium means that there are other genes which are correlated with the one that you're interested in, and these other genes do other things that break the uh, uh, assumptions. So for example, if we had, so P stands for, again, parentage, because the association comes from uh, uh, being, being passed down jointly. Uh, to the uh, parents. Uh, G1 and G2 would be associated, and if G2 affects other things, then G1 has an association with Y other than through X, and that should not occur. So that could uh, be a problem. So this is also something that, uh, from the genetic point of view, knowing the genes and what exactly they do and with what genes they are in linkage disequilibrium with, People do try and look at this and very check this, that they are uh, not in danger of um, violating the assumptions in this way. <coughs> so sometimes people also worry that they might not have the causal gene for the exposure that they want. Uh, that in itself is not necessarily a problem. So you could think of it as measurement error, you can think of it in different ways. but. If it basically means this, so let's say G2 is the causal gene for the exposure, but what you have measured is G1, then G1 still has an association with X, uh, it's still independent of U, it's still independent of Y, so we would still be fine in this situation. It's only if there are then also other effects uh, from the other gene. Okay, this. Uh, I think this is the last topic in the possible violations, and this is a really important one nowadays because people do use more and more genes that they find from GWAS studies that are associated, and they all often find lots of them, uh, in particular body mass index. When X is body mass index, um, there are many studies that now use multiple genes. So uh, 
this would be um, uh, graphically how you would show this, where here I'm drawing it so that they are independent, but G1, G2, G3 don't need to be independent, they could also be dependent. This in itself, again, would not be a problem. Each one of them individually would be a valid instrument, but you would think that you are exploiting more information if you use them jointly, so then it's an interesting methodological problem of how to use them jointly. <coughs> Um, but let me explain with the, with the graph also what, uh, what has recently um, been investigated. If you have multiple instruments like this, mm -hmm. you can even allow some of them to violate the conditions. So let's say you get a whole bunch, 20 genes or so, from a GWAS study uh, that you find are associated with X. And now you, you think, well, not all of them will be satisfying all the instrumental variable assumptions but you can show that certain methods still work if uh, about half of them are violating the assumptions but the other half are valid and you don't need to know which ones. So uh, people are looking at these kind of methods now and that's quite an exciting area because it allows for, it's, it makes it more realistic to allow for violations um, but you also want to use multiple genes. Um, also another thing is that you, if you use each one individually you should all be they should all be estimating the same cause and effect. So if they estimate different cause and effects, the assumptions are violated, or <coughs> we might uh, actually have uh, heterogeneity in the cause and effects, which is another thing that uh, is interesting to look at. <coughs> okay, so we use the genes to uh, check them each other whether they um, uh, satisfy the assumptions. Uh, we might use them together to strengthen our um, analysis. And on this slide it should say that these are the recent developments where people are uh, using things like robust regression, so things like LASSO, etc. Or also uh, another method based on the idea of meta-analysis, combining all the effects you estimate from the multiple genes into one overall effect and then uh, uh, account adjusting for the bias a bit like you adjust for bias in a meta-analysis. And the bias would be due to violations of the assumptions. <coughs> uh, okay, so this was a bit about possible violations. Um, and the, uh, the, the, the problem still is well, you need to find the instruments when you want to investigate a particular cause and effect to just find the instruments that allow you this. Um, and genome-wide association studies, I was quite skeptical at some time about uh, the use of this because I thought you cannot really convince yourself of the assumptions, but with these new methods, maybe there is a bit of um, headway to be gained. <coughs> okay, so um, maybe I'll spend just a few minutes to give you an idea of how we use instruments to estimate causal parameters, but I'm going to skip through some slides. Slides. Don't, don't worry, I'm, I know what I'm doing. <laughs> okay, so uh, this is a slide to give you a quick idea of how a method works, which is known as the two stage least squares, uh, which is the kind of fundamental method of using instrumental variables. Um, so, uh, in, this, in this little illustration, we have our exposure x, assume it's continuous, <coughs> or exposure y, assume it's continuous. <coughs> And let's say the unobserved confounder, uh, u1, u2, u3, is basically the three clusters go each with uh, the three levels of a confounder. So you see that within each value of the confounder, you have a negative association. Okay, but if, because we don't observe this, we would observe it without those three labels, and we just put a linear regression through there, and we would get a positive association. But now let's, let's assume you have an instrument, and the instrument are the two different colors, so it has two values. So it shifts x a bit with the red ones a bit to the uh, to higher values. Okay, so that's what the instrument is doing. Uh, so this, is, this would be naively the, the positive uh, regression line between y and x. Um, and if we, what we do first is we do a regression so this is two stage least squares. We do a regression of x on the instrument, and we do a regression of y on the instrument, and then we plot the, uh, the, the blue dots are the means, 
and then you take a regression through that. And that now gives you the correct negative slope. Okay, so this is a little graphical illustration for this sort of estimator. Uh, so this is just uh, the formula um, in terms of regression coefficient, regression of y on the instrument divided by regression coefficient of x on the instrument. This is the simplest possible case where everything is univariate and nicely linear and it has lots of nice properties, in particular it's simple in this case. It generalizes when you have uh, uh, vectors, you just do the linear regressions and plug in the predicted values, these kind of things. Um, it has, it is also quite robust. What, the only assumption it really needs is that in the outcome regression, so for y, given x and u, you need this additive separation in the mean uh, and the linearity in x. Uh, and what you do need also, as you can see, is that we're not dividing by zero, right? And the, better, the more away from zero we are, we are, the better, and that's called a strong instrument then. So we want the covariance between x and g to be large compared to the covariance between y and g. So that's a strong instrument. Um, now, a bit of um, our work has gone into uh, how to do this when we have a binary outcome. Because people have suggested in the binary outcome, obviously you don't want to do a linear regression to just replace the regression coefficient by a log odds ratio, and that is it doesn't work so well. It hasn't got nice properties, not consistent really. Um, so we've spent a bit of time on improving this. So the, the other slides are about uh, this, these improvements, um, and there. Uh, They, uh, the problem is that they start relying on um, the uh, uh, assumptions that you make about the exposure distribution. So the nice thing about two slash least squares is that it relies <coughs> on assumptions about the outcome only, which is what we are interested in. Yeah, we wouldn't normally, if, if we just did the normal regression analysis, we would just specify the outcome distribution. <coughs> uh, but uh, other methods for more complicated situations rely on the exposure distribution. So recent um, methodological developments have been looking into uh, making, uh, finding robust um, methods that are not so um, sensitive towards assumptions in the exposure distributions, for example. So um, this brings me to the end of the talk. I just wanted to give you a bit of an outlook at the end uh, of uh, what there is to come. And lots of other slides. Uh, I have also left slides for possible questions. But there is some summary somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Okay.